So we said that there's two types of love. The type that's from the memale, which means that a person appreciates and loves Hashem because he feels Hashem in himself. And that's the life force that's in him. But that has its ups and downs and depends on what he's meditating on at the time. And we said that there's another type of life, uh, of love, sovev kolalmin, which comes from the sovev, from the surrounding light, the limitless light. And there it doesn't change ever, except that he does add here a statement that it kol chad lefum That even though it doesn't, um, it, it's not a feeling, you can't feel it the way that you feel your life force. You can't connect to it the same way. You can't sense it the same way. But it still depends on some ability of your, uh, uh, that you have, a level of ability that you have to appreciate it. And uh, I was thinking, yesterday we started Daf Yomi uh, Erchen. And Erchen begins with the difference between a person's value and a person's worth. I guess those are the two words you would probably choose. That his worth, I'm using it, I mean, I think they're interchangeable. So I'll just say that his worth, I'll use for Erech. So his worth changes based on his age. And from age one month to, uh, to so and so, and from age this to this, it change, it, but it's constant. Meaning, an each age group, every single person is worth the same thing. It's like one of the uh, one of the uh, sources of the idea, and Chazal uh, actually say this: that the soul in everybody is the same. But even though it's the same in everybody, and so everybody has the same worth, but it changes from the, in, during different periods of life. And when you're younger, it's worth much less. By the way, this this is contradictory to the Western mentality that uh, that the death of an innocent child is much worse and causes much more upheaval and, and retaliation than, uh, than uh, the death of, a, of an older uh, person. By, by, by Yiddishka, it's very clear that until age 60, your value is only, only going up. And then once you, you hit 60, it starts to go down. But again, the worth, sorry. So the, why? Because you've been in the world for a longer time and in one sense, what you can appreciate is exactly this uh, connection, this uh, connection to the surrounding light. You appreciate it more as time goes on. And then at some point you hit a plateau, or even you, you go down. But, but it's the idea that there is some kind of change, but the change is very limited. And, and, and it's, it's more like how much you can appreciate it, and it's the same by everybody in, 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 some, in some sense. Value, on the other hand, is how much you would be worth as somebody who works. So different people have different value, different obviously, potentials. different skills, different abilities. Uh, the age makes a big difference, and, and so on. So okay. the sovev, the love in the sovev, would that be similar to the love of Palisro? Yes. yes. That's a very good uh, explanation. And, and w whereas Memale would be like uh, uh, the love of, um, of one's spouse. Yeah. And, and the good thing that comes out of love from, from the Sovev, from the limitless light, is not only that it's unchanging, but it also, there's nothing in the world that can douse it, that can, that can, uh, that can put it out. So after the parentheses, somewhere towards the bottom, okay. there's long parentheses um, and one line. Start, the line starts with often, Mishum often. We, we learned about this in Parshas Noach. Uh, all the all the Dibure Amatchil, all the SVs that start um, which means uh, tumultuous or, or much water cannot tumultuous. put out tumultuous, won't be able to put out love. And it's a passage from Shira Shirim. Because really it's not sensed internally. It's rather just a sort of like a distant appreciation. This type of love, the love that comes from the limitless light, can never be put out and it doesn't change based on a person's uh, state of mind, his state of emotions, and so on. 
וכל אחד לפעמים שהוא רדילה יש לו מבחינת האהבה הזו כי לכתיב ועמך כולם צדיקים is that this love is always uh, 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 can always be sensed in that sense I keep using the word for memala uh, it could always be appreciated and the idea is that it's standing like a surround like something surrounding the person between the person and Hashem it's like a sign of the covenant between them In general, a covenant is always that there's somebody on top, somebody on bottom, and a sign of the covenant in between. That's so the way it's done. So you're far enough away from it not to be confronted by the nuance. Correct. And therefore, it's a, it's a global appreciation mm-hmm. which is not affected by minutia. Yesterday I had somebody that I was talking to, and he um, had... An old, older individual, and he, he had some trouble with his, with his father. So... With his father? Yeah, his father was even, an, even older. Wow! <laughs> how, how, I would have thought at that age it wouldn't be a problem. It's all, it's all the same, it's always the same. So he talked about the fact that... that parents see children both as Soviv and Memele. Meaning the parents... But, are able to see both the value and the worth of their children. Whereas the person himself is very hard, is very challenged to see his worth. You'll only see his value. So, um, in this case was his, va- his father invited him to go with him to a business meeting. And he took it as, well, you certainly brought me along so that I would contribute. <laughs> But his father was very upset after the meeting was over, and he, and he actually went and even did stuff based on the meeting, which the father never discussed. They're sort of partners in this business venture, but not, it's not clear exactly who's, who's, the, who's running it and who's I'm not. Yeah, it's family, I think. <laughs> so so he was very, uh, his father was very upset that he had uh, done something, that he had spoken out during the meeting also, and, and then he went and did something based on the meeting. And he said, I, don't, I can't understand what, what in the world, did, like, the, the bottom line was, why did you invite me if you didn't want me to contribute? He said, parents don't see you necessarily as somebody who contributes. <laughs> They don't rely on you to contribute money to the... But there's no value here. We're not looking for value, at least when it's rectified. It's actually a sign that it's rectified. But the person sees his value. He sees, what am I worth? <laughs> what, what's my value? So if you invited me to something, it's certainly so that I would use my talents, my abilities. You know, I, maybe he invited you just because he wanted you next to him. Like, in a certain sense, that's seeing the worth of something. And just saying, having you near me, or having you sit next to me, That's enough for me. I, I didn't expect you to say anything. I just expect, like, I see that value. And you know what? Other people do too. But the person himself is hard-pressed to see his value. He'll only see his objective worth. Because we're also very subjective. So we look at ourselves from the point of view of, of, uh, of what talents do we have? What do we, what do, what's our value? That's how we measure ourselves. But parents especially will see us as objective creatures that they're very connected to. They'll never want to sever that connection, but they don't necessarily look at the value. They don't necessarily look at, you know, what are you good for? <laughs> Again, if they're very rectified, it could be that they're not rectified, and then, uh, then they, they don't see that. They, they only say, you know, hey, I gave you food till age six, get out of here and get to go take care of yourself. That's enough for me. 
but uh, most parents, especially Jewish parents, don't have that. They, they see the, the worth throughout life. So, it, I, it, yes, it helped him a lot to, to, to think of his father. That he doesn't have children that are old enough, actually. But I think once you, once you have children that are old enough, and they begin to... They begin to... How do you say that? They disappoint. They disappoint you. So you search in yourself and you say, where's, where's the connection, really? And you, and you come to the conclusion, my connection to them is not predicated on, on how much they do or don't do. My connection to them is, is limitless. So it's 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 erchi. It's like just what 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 they're just the connection itself. That's a silver type of connection. Okay. Anyway. So that type of connection is between the Jewish people and Hashem. So why in the end there's many names that you could call Hashem. Why do you why do you choose Kadosh? Kadosh Baruch Hu. Baruch Hu is just a, an addition. But the, the, the adjective is Kadosh. He's holy. Why don't you say that he's merciful? We have thirteen adjectives you can use. At least thirteen. In fact you probably find a hundred if you really wanted to. It says in there, there's a matter that says Hashem has seventy names. What names does he give? All the adjectives. He's merciful. He's, he's compassionate. He's, he's uh, forgiving. He's all these things. Why do they? Why is the thing that everybody uses kadosh? That he's holy. Ki kol hashemot bekinuim and hashem hitavu tapura nimshechet mitoy itbarach vafilu hashem avayu hashem shemavim meayin leyesh. All the different adjectives that you can think of, except for holy, even Hashem's name as an action. Hashem's name, Yud Kei Vav Kei, also means a word. It means to bring into being. So he's the creator. But they call it Bashefer in Yiddish. And some people, like in Chabad, they say Eivishter. And in most, of, most of the other Hasidim actually say, say Bashefer. Bashefer means a creator. And that's how you call him in English also. By creator, you mean you're a prime mover in that concept? In that context? The one who brought the world into being. So all these adjectives, they're really memali, they're really talking about how he brings himself into reality okay, and is affected by reality. That's the main thing. That's what we talked about yesterday and the day before. But only it's etzim vit pashtut. No, throughout the whole world. He's affected. He's, he, he, you can't say that he doesn't care. It's a real hashgacha. Real hashgacha means etzim vit pashtut. There's the thing itself, there's the Shem, and it's how he extends into reality. The extension of the act. I know this uses one of the examples that we gave two days ago. I think two days ago, or one day ago. We said that there are three examples that the altar ever gives of etzim vit pashtut, yeah. and five examples of helem vegilui. And then Rabbi Hillel Farish, he expands them a great deal. Must have been yesterday. Must have been yesterday. So one of the three, the one I said he, he, he carried over from the time before Petterberg and, and afterwards from Liajna to Liadi was the one about um, action, kinetic energy being transferred from a person's hand to a stone. And that's the extension of the person's hand. It's like that the power that I had here in my arm has now departed. It's gone somewhere else. Except that by Hashem, when it departs, he's also affected back by it. Meaning, the, it can be like a boomerang. It can come back to you also. It's not just that you're throwing it away. It's also affecting you in some way. Or, uh, if we were in space, then the moment that I throw something uh, away, I'd also feel Newton's right first law for every action is an equal and positive reaction, and I'd feel myself being pushed in the other direction. So Hashem is affected, as it were. But that's only from a tzilus and down. So when we say Kadosh, we mean to say that it's really Helem Vigilu. We really mean to say that Hashem is above all this. He's not affected. He doesn't change. When we say Kadosh Baruch Hu, we mean to say that he's the connection... He's sanctified by the connection. No, he's sanctified no? because he's above the connection. The connection is always there. I don't know. You know what? I don't know if you're wrong. But the, the idea of being sanctified is to being removed. That's what it literally means in Hebrew. To be kadosh is to be removed. But to be sanctified, it means to be sanctified by 
by something. No, that's not. Can't be sanctified in a vacuum. Can that's exactly the point that it's removed from something else. You could say that it's in relation to something else, but uh, so it must if be nobody us. if nobody recognizes that you're separate, so it must be us. It doesn't mean that you're not holy. Uh, you could be very separate and live in a, as a hermit somewhere and be very holy, very separate, but uh, nobody would know. So you'd still be holy. He, Hashem, yeah, nobody uh, has to tell of you. Of course, that. but then Hashem, if, if Hashem doesn't receive feedback from us, no. No, no, when I say no, feedback, something to holiness. push up against. Yeah, we say that his holiness is such that he doesn't need uh, he doesn't need anything to. Doesn't the word to to mean sanctified? Yeah, anyway, sanctified here is not a verb; it's an adjective. He's not being sanctified; he just is sanctified. Remember, this is what we started with, right? Because we said that if a person sanctifies himself a little bit from below, he sanctified a great deal from above. That was one of the first things that we read here. And he wanted to explain what this was. So he said, to explain what this is, I have to tell you about Bechol Modecha. And we went into this whole discussion about how, how these two types of love. And now we're coming out of this discussion. And he says that when you say sanct- that, that somebody is holy, somebody is sanctified, what you're, see- what you're saying is, that there's no change really, that they've come to a state where their status, their 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 uh, their, their level is constant. It it, it, it it relates to the atmos, to the to the thing in and of itself, without how it appears, not how it's revealed. So the type of love that comes from this type of relationship to Hashem as above the world, surrounding the world, transcendent, as we say today, this type of love is what we call holiness. This is holiness. Whereas, how can you sanctify yourself um, with things that are integrated into the world is a whole different question. But here what we're saying is that the type of love that we're looking for is the type of love that would be called holy love, and it's called holy because it's transcendent above the world. The way that it's revealed, this type of love, in the person, is actually by removing something. Like sanctification, it's like removing yourself, taking yourself out of out of where you were before, becoming separate. So the 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 holiness here is revealed through circumcision. Circumcision is a symbol of something being removed. When you remove it, what you're saying is really that I'm not going to be immersed, only immersed within my reality. Okay. That I have the ability to transcend. I have the ability to go beyond my needs, beyond my emotions, beyond my feelings, beyond my sexual needs, all these things. I'm able to go beyond it. So so that's why it's a it's a it's an act of of of, uh, of uh, severing, of taking off. And the orla, the I don't know how you say it in the, the foreskin yeah, is how they say it in English, but really it means um, Somebody who's arel, somebody who's who's uh, who is the way you would usually explain it is atum that he is um, how do you say he's he's closed off he's he's uh, secluded he's not secluded the wrong word he's cut off he's like he's in himself and he has no ability to hear anything on the outside he can't relate to other people's feelings and so on so he says so you. you probably say that at some level you know, what it is well maybe you know, maybe, maybe more thought but okay um, I had a, a rabbi once who's a children said that he was autistic they meant it in a in a complimentary way in a complimentary way he was able to to sit in a room with a hundred people like be in his world like not not at all not at all well, sensing what was going on yeah. So he says, he, here it's negative. To be an arel means that you're cut off from reality because you're, you're, you're locked into yourself because you can't hear what's going on. It's not because you're transcendent. 
it's on the, it's on the contrary. You're so in the memala, you're so in your experiences, you're so into yourself that you can't feel anything on the outside. Whereas somebody who's transcendent sees everything. He's very aware of everything that's going. He's just he's just above it, but he certainly sees it. He's not locked into himself at all. To be holy is not to be um, uh, indifferent. Uh, Maybe that's the wrong word also. Yeah. It's not to be uh, um, uh, uh, unsympathetic, yeah. oblivious to things. You, you, you know exactly what's going on, and you can even sense the pain and the, and, the, and the joy and whatever other people have. But in some sense, you're above it. And you have to stay that way. You have to stay above it. Like as parents, we all know that, right? When the child is having a, this and that problem. So the worst thing is to uh, <laughs> to go Teach into it. the problem with them, <laughs> suffer with them, because what do you need uh, when you when you have a problem? What you really need is somebody who's big enough to both hear you, listen to you, empathize with you, sympathize with you, but not be affected by you. Because if you fall down with me, who's going to lift both of us up? Right? So so that that means to be kadosh. Really, that's what it means. So a person who's a real is like somebody who's so into themselves that they can't feel anything outside. They don't know at all what's going on with other people. So they don't perceive it. Except he says, well, he, just, he says, that the, don't think of this as being uh, uh, like a shell that's impenetrable. Just think about it as a covering. And a covering can always be removed. Don't, so if, if autism really is that, then don't think about it as something that you know, the person's in a perfect uh, uh, shell that it can never be broken. No, there's a way to remove that uh, that covering. It's only a covering. That's what he wants to say. Yeah. So. So, so, Moshe Rabbeinu called himself Arel Svatayim. Right. That he, it's very interesting because he couldn't bring it out. Mm-hmm. So there's a covering on his on his uh, on his on his lips. And where did that covering come from? Why was he unable to express himself? We know. Through the cold. Yeah, how did Chazal explain it? It's very psychological. They say he he was asked a question, or not really asked, but he was given given a choice. And when he was about to choose, what happened was... Wrong choice. (laughs) No, it was the right choice. No, no, we're right. (laughs) And something caused him... So we say like a, an angel. An came. angel. What we would say today is, maybe it is an angel, but it manifested in the person as an inability to to express his choice, and instead it became something that hurt him. So now it's like a trauma. Every time that you come to express yourself, the thing that happens is that you feel pain. So and he felt. Where do you feel the pain? In, in his lips. But he was healed of that. So eventually, Hashem healed it. From healed him from it but but he thought it, he thought initially that he couldn't express himself there was no way that he would ever be able to express himself again he had the the Chazal when they we don't know the Torah doesn't say that uh, this is what happened again, but Chazal are telling us this is one of the ways that it can happen that you experience the trauma as a little child of trying to express yourself and being cut off like I'm giving that to, to my uh, eight-year-old now all the time I don't put coals on his uh, on his uh, on his, uh, on his, uh, on his lips, but he has a tremendous voice. And every once in a while, I forget I'm not supposed to say anything. They tell him, they tell him, stop yelling. <laughs> and and I see as he gets older, he's he's he, it, it affects him more and more. Like it used to be when he was young, you would just uh, sort of ignore it. But now as he gets older, and and my wife keeps telling me. Look at what you're doing. You're, like, you're not, you can't say this to him. So I work on it really hard. Maybe I'd say it once a day now. But it's a lot. It's a lot to say to somebody, look, you're yelling. It's his voice. He doesn't He doesn't know how to speak differently. Uh, so you can't say stop talking. You know, say, talk more quietly. But even that's a little bit of a, of a slap. You have to be very careful with these things, not to stop somebody's expression. Anyway. My fault. 
והוא בחינת העבר עבר רעה בתענוגות בני אדם, אף שהוא בהיתר, רק שהוא בחמימות והתלהבות הטבע. So what does it mean when a person is a rel, that he has an orla? It means that he's too engrossed in his own cravings. So really, the Rambam said, unfortunately the Rambam never finished the sentence. Everybody knows now. As the Rambam says in Mor Nevuchim, that why do we circumcise? In order to decrease the pleasure from sex. Okay, that's what he writes. It's true. It's, it's known to be true. Because really? when you remove the foreskin, you remove a lot of nerve endings with it. I don't know why it doesn't hurt more than it hurts when, when you do it, but um, apparently it, without the foreskin, it's a lot less... No, sorry, you don't remove the nerve endings. The nerve endings are on the, on the male member, and the, the foreskin causes more uh, friction. So it actually increases the enjoyment from uh, intercourse. What the Rambam didn't finish, I don't know why, is the end of the sentence. Why do we do that? Why do, why do you do that? Because you want the person to be more sensitive to his wife. Because if you're entirely engrossed just in yourself, there's no ability to take care of her needs. You're, you're, if, if, if you have that uh, uh, amount of, 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 self, of self-involvement while you're with your wife, then you can't even think about what she needs. So we decrease it. Not because we don't want you to have enjoyment. We want to have as much pleasure as you want. It's mutter. But because there's two people here, we don't tell a person, look, because there's also a, in the mouth, when you eat. So there's a lot of taste buds. We don't go and we burn half of them off because we say, ah, you shouldn't enjoy this world. Of course not, that's nonsense. Because nobody else is enjoying the food except for you. So we, don't, we have no such need. But when it comes to, again, this is all in terms of trying to understand what the Raman said, we decrease the pleasure because we want you to be more aware of your surroundings, to be more aware of your spouse. And if it wasn't that way, then, then, then you would be entirely an areli, you would be entirely covered only in yourself. This is called, this is what's called by, by, the, by Lavan, that the atufim lelevan, that the tuma in the end is a person engrossed in themselves. Tuma comes from the word atum, which is really to be closed off in a shell. That there is a perfect shell there and he doesn't feel and doesn't sense anything that's on the outside. So if that's your state, so you actually, you heat yourself up. You, you, you only need yourself. You don't need anybody else. In the end, you'll understand that you don't even need a spouse. What do I need? But what we're trying to do here is to tell you that there's no greater act than actually giving pleasure to another human being. And that, that's the main thing. Baruch Hashem, you also get pleasure from it. When you get stuck, you also get pleasure. But the greatness of it is that, is that you're, you're giving to somebody else. וזהו שכתוב, יגיע כפיך כי תאכל. כלומר, שהכפיים יגיעים, או הרגליים, ושאר האיברים החיצוניים, ולא לב. See, this is also is, is done in, in, in a, it means a very positive thing. That when you work, it should also be the same way. Meaning, don't just take pleasure in your work, but look at <coughs> the acts that you're doing is how they affect the world, and not necessarily how they cause you to be happy with what... It's not, it's not about the satisfaction. Okay. It's saying that when a person's mind and heart are in his work, what they're looking for is a satisfaction in the work. And, and by Hasidus, there's this whole idea that in, 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 in our mundane acts, they should be a little hollow. Meaning that I'm not fully present inside them. I'm not, because I'm not looking for the satisfaction that they'll bring. I'm doing it because it needs to be done. I need to make a pranasa. But not because this is, uh, this is where, my, where I'm engrossed. That's like, a lot of people don't understand. The, the, the Rebbe, uh, all the Rebbe said, this is the source. All the Rebbe said that when you, when you work, you shouldn't put your mind into it. Just be the, work, the labor of your hands. A lot of people say, well, what do you mean? I, how do you do that? Can I be an accountant and not put my head into it? How can, how can you do it without your head? Yeah, you can. How? Because work is work, and what's not was not work. I think what the Rebbe was talking about is taking your work into your private life. And if you need to. 
What, what happens if you have an account and you're an accountant and it's a huge account and you can't you can't put them you can't let them down. There's a due date for the filing and whatever. And what can you do? It's now going to take you know uh, two nights that you're going to be away from home. So that's what you have to do. So you can't do that. He says no. Of course you can do that. It's not the amount of time. It's to be engrossed means to search for satisfaction in it. That's really what it means. To be engrossed is to be a tomb. They say there's nothing in the world except for this. It's true that sometimes it'll it'll it, it can it impact. can it can impact your 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 family life if you're a tomb. But the point here isn't that, isn't that. The point is don't take satisfaction from it. Take satisfaction from other places. Your satisfaction should be from something else. For instance, uh, so we we hold that the word satisfaction is about it, as idolatrous as there is. But let's say that there's okay satisfactions. For instance, a person gives tzedakah. So you take satisfaction from tzedakah. But to take satisfaction from my accomplishments, from my work, is to miss the point. You should leave that, that inner sense of involvement, of engrossment, of inner pleasure for, thing, for other things. Learning. Okay. Even those who are of cold nature, meaning they don't easily get excited by what they do, and they're called Yoshev Alim, people who learn Torah. So to learn Torah, you have to be a marash You have to have, you have to have uh, what they used to call uh, what's the word? I forgot. Melancholy. Why do you have to have melancholy? Because melancholy, or, yeah, actually, the old word used to be cynical, but they stopped using it because cynical became something negative, mamish negative. But cynical, cynical is basically cynics in uh, in. Uh, Yaakov already left. I have to go catch up with him. Cynics, just finished with this. The cynics in ancient Rome were people who who gave up on, on pl- the pleasures of life. And really, they were very holy in that sense. That they said, they were cynical about life, meaning they said, all of life, all the pleasures you can get out of life, they're really like a dog's uh, upchuck. That's why it's called cynicism, because it comes from, from the word canine. That's what they compared life to. But they didn't compare all of life, because they felt that the, that the, the real worth of life was, uh, was learning, was philosophy. They were very spiritual people. And they said all these pleasures in Rome, they came at the height of Rome, like when Rome was the richest. And they Debauchery. Saw the, they saw the decadence. And they, they were disgusted by this. It makes us throw up. It's just disgusting, this whole thing. So they, they, they receded into cynicism, which really meant that they receded into philosophy. One of the main cynics was Marcus Aurelius, which is why I told you once that I think he's my main contender for who uh, Rebis Antoninus was. Uh, he's one of the possibilities. And his name wasn't just Marcus Aurelius. It was Marcus Antoninus Antonio. Da, 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 da. He had uh, seven names. Every time they moved up, they got another name. So anyway, so that, that's really a person who's cold by nature. He's, he's melancholy. He's cold. Melancholy people are cold. They have cold skin. That's how they used to describe it. The idea was that he's not impressed by nature. He's not impressed by, by pleasure. It doesn't give him. The only pleasure he really feels is when he learns. So now he's going to talk about these people. Okay. <laughs>